Knights of Columbus Council 126 is a proud sponsor of the Gaelic American. Now celebrating over 125 years of activism in Brooklyn, our council raises funds for seminarians, animal shelters, scholarships, and other worthy causes. Stop by a council anytime to drop off an application. Chucky and Lot. See ya. Send the stars in the sky. I was born into it. Um, the culture around this part of Tyrone, where, we're, where we lived and where our family have lived for centuries, is very much steeped in Irish nationalism and, and, and um, the, the old Gaelic style of life and Irish music and tradition and folklore and whatnot. So initially, um, I was very conscious of the fact that you know I was Irish, and uh, I also quite early on became conscious of the fact that. We were not, because by virtue of the fact that we were Irish, we were being treated as second-class citizens. Bear in mind that um, we're living in the, in the north of Ireland, statelet, and um, those of us of the native Irish Catholic origin were discriminated against, actively so. And um, we found ourselves hacked off by partition in 1922. Um, and there was um, a unionist government in charge which did nothing, it discriminated against the Catholic uh, minority as a cause, even though my grandparents saw themselves as part of the wider nationalist uh, majority in Ireland. But all of a sudden, after 22, we had become an artificial minority. So we were very conscious of that. 
I suppose the real awakening point for me personally would have been 1966, which was when the um, the southern state was celebrating the, the 50th anniversary of the 1916 Rising. And by virtue of the fact that you know we have a big family, especially on my mother's side, I have something like 40 first cousins, we were all gathered at, around that Easter time at Granny's house, my maternal grandmother's house in North Monaghan, not far from the border. And we watched on our television um, each night a, a program called Insurrection, I believe it was, which is kind of a, a mockumentary documentary um, style program in which um, the blow-by-blow -blow accounts of the 1916 Rising and men were inside, you know, the GPO, um, various actors had been employed to reenact what, what had happened. And it made a huge impression on us to the extent that the following day we would be out in Granny's old hay shed, it was the GPO, and we'd be reenacting what we'd seen. So we'd all have names. I think I was at one point Sean McDermott. Uh, um, uh, and uh, so we all had various titles and names and spent our time with sticks, rifles, a bit of sticks as rifles, uh, fighting off these imaginary British invaders. And after that, of course, what this actually had done was pre program people like me for the Troubles, which were only a matter of years away. So I guess 1968 wore into 1969, the Troubles broke out. I have vivid recollections of that because um, I was, whatever I was, 10 years of age. We saw what was going on on our television sets in, in Derry with the, the Bogside uprising and whatnot. But we'd hear around us what was happening locally. And there, was, there were rumours were rife in August of 1969 that the, the Irish army was going to <clears throat> invade or come into the north and reclaim the north and of course this was music to the ears of nationalists, of Catholic nationalists and rumours were swirling around that um, men had to get ready, um, buses were going to pick them up, um, they were going to join the Irish army and all the rest of it. So I remember persuading my parents and again as I say we live in a rural area to let me sit up and if possible go with my father if he was going. Um, so we, I set up to the early hours of the morning, but no bus ever materialised. Uh, but my dad and I went out, and um, I remember us walking to just a few yards from the house down the country road, and we could hear gunfire, not a lot of gunfire taking place. And <clears throat> these were live rounds being fired in the local town of Dungannon, uh, fired into protesters, and they were being fired by the B specials, by our neighbours. And I think eight or nine people had been wounded. Fortunately, no one was killed in that kind of night in, in the Dungannon area, but several had been wounded. So this made a huge impression upon me, and especially so that we could see our, one of our Protestant neighbours, um, the woman going around, checking the doors in the barn with the lights on, checking the barn, carrying a rifle, and all we had were sticks, sticks, and that was mm -hmm. it. You know, <clears throat> so. Um, Shortly, her husband was, was part of the B-Specials and they would have been on patrol and on duty that particular night. So we, these, these were making a huge, as you can imagine, a nine or ten year old, the impression that it was having me, mm -hmm. and literally thereafter. Mm -hmm. So I effectively um, grew up in, in that type of militaristic situation that was, that was all around us. Uh, helicopters were the norm. Um, the IRA at the stage had rejuvenated considerably, it had almost all but disappeared after the 1956-60 period of three campaign and uh, went through its own kind of convulsions with the Marxist element trying to neutralize it. But what you had was a resurrection of probably the old defender movement um, in, in the rural areas of Ireland, in many cases rural areas of the north and of course in Belfast as well. And these morphed together into the provisional IRA and um, it was quite obviously a, a Catholic organisation and a defenderist type organisation which is traditional here from the 1600s since times of the plantations, you know, the native Irish Catholics would band together to protect their own interests and um, mm -hmm. uh, you were seeing a re-manifestation of that, albeit now under the sort of the guise of republicanism. And my aspirations were of course growing up was firmly on the side of fighting for the Irish cause to bring about uh, an expulsion of the British. Uh, and that's how I suppose I was moulded in, in my mindset and again drawing from history because this particular area had seen numerous uprisings, in fact it was a centre, the epicentre in many cases of various risings from the time of the Nine Years War in 1592-3 all the way through 1641 rebellion which was essentially took place uh, 
was conceived more or less in a friary a few fields from where we're sitting at the end of the 1970s the, the IRA campaign was still going but it was being ground down slowly but surely and uh, hardly surprising like we were what we were talking we were talking about young men and women with supplied with weaponry whatever from the United States from our from our Irish American cousins and we were being as we saw it stabbed in the back by the southern state they didn't send the army in to protect us in 1969 and now they were using their army uh, to uh, back up the British in the north and uh, capture any of our men heading south. And you had the Irish army was in the Lebanon, of all places, or in Cyprus. Why weren't they in Tyrone fighting? But however, we were here in, in Tyrone, we were you know, quite happy to do the fighting ourselves. But having said that, um, our patriotism, you know, it needed material and it needed uh, manpower. And slowly but surely we were running out of both uh, towards the end of the 1970s. And so many of our volunteers, so many of our young Republicans were in prison and they were in, at that stage, undergoing horrendous uh, conditions because the British had de facto treated them as prisoners of war from the early 70s up until the mid 70s. But then they changed policy and they decided to criminalise the entire Irish rising, the entire Irish uh, Republican uh, um, campaign. And these young men refused to be criminalised. And uh, I don't have to rehash all of this, but they wouldn't wear prison uniforms, they wouldn't take part in, in the regime. And they ended up sitting in blankets, sitting in cells with just blankets wrapped around them. And um, they had to apply their own excrement to the walls and it went through a horrendous time. And while this garnered a lot of support locally, it was not gaining them uh, any real traction, certainly not abroad. And, um, it came to the point that the only outcome could possibly was for them to have a embark upon hunger, a hunger strike. And um, the guys in prison became an inspiration for many of us because they refused to knuckle down, they refused to be criminalised. And why should they be? You know, we were patriots fighting for our nation, fighting for our freedom. Right. And we were this was in a crime wave as the British tried to portray it. So anyway, the first hunger strike uh, took place, it began in, in October of 1980 and I took an active part in the HBOC campaign, so I became a member of uh, one of the, the HBOC committees here in Tyrone and we took off in Tyrone, it really, really, uh, really caught fire here and I discovered that I had um, a talent, if you like, for rabble rousing, for giving speeches and whatnot and suddenly we were in quite a bit of demand and we would travel all around um, the, the Tyrone rural countryside and we had meetings, uh, rallies every practically every night of the week um, in little rural areas, you know, in, in some of the villages and some of the towns, but also out in the parishes. Mm -hmm. And um, these were having an enormous effect. It was an eye opener for us because we found all of a sudden that uh, the British didn't know what to do. Uh, there were jeep loads of them would come out and British, you know, the British troops in the, in the, hiding in the ditches and the RUC and their Land Rovers uh, trying to keep control on us. But they didn't know what to do and they were being told not to sort of interfere because like, there was a lot of international media involved. Mm -hmm. And um, we suddenly found that we could march about and insult them, you know, and get, I was getting up on platforms and able to let it into the British occupation forces and with well, applause and the people. It was giving us a whole new surge of, uh, of energy and a whole and raising morale tremendously. But of course, men were paying for this. There were seven men, I believe, on hunger strike at the time and their, their, their conditions were deteriorating by the day. And our concern was that um, the Thatcher government at the time would not capitulate, you know, would not give in to the fairly simple, basic demands. And as well as hindsight, they weren't going to do it. They weren't going to do it easily anyway, that's for sure. So um, we nevertheless persevered, we got out. And what was happening was the struggle was taking on a whole new dimension Probably we weren't even fully aware of that at the time, but it was happening. It was becoming more, it was mobilising again, as it had done maybe 10 years earlier with the civil rights movement. And we were going in down a political route. And um, up to that, it was very, very uh, purely material, um, um, militaristic. Um, mm -hmm. I had never voted. Uh, I, I think I might have maybe got on the electoral list. I may have gone out once, but only to spoil my ballot by writing Irish slogans in Gaelic and, and Irish and telling the British what they, where they should go and so forth and was called spying your vote effectively. Um, but then the first hunger strike came to an end and we were all of a sudden 
very deflated. We were elated that it had ended, but we believed that maybe it had ended because the guys had achieved what they were set out to do. And then they had, it took years for this to emerge. They had been promised one thing, and of course the British, typically with um, classic duplicity, Perfidious Albion had uh, turned around and, and, and basically cheated on what they had said. And the guys were left that they had gone through all that suffering and achieved nothing. And the outcome of that was that there was going to be another hunger strike. And that began in March, early March, 1st of March, I think, of 1981. And I remember thinking to myself, oh, uh, myself and a couple of comrades um, were, were driving along somewhere and we heard it in the car already. We knew it was coming, but it was a whole different atmosphere to the, to the previous hunger strike from a couple of months earlier in that it was going to be very difficult to mobilise people. Suddenly, in the early one, people were out, the, the blood was up, there was you know, huge demonstrations taking place in Belfast and Dublin that we in Throne were all going to and so forth. And um, the wind had been pulled out of our sails to some extent. And we knew it was going to be not easy, it would be difficult to get the thing up and running again. But nothing else for it, we did it. And the old hardcore started to come out and we started to sort of do what we did. But um, all of a sudden the change came when Frank McGuire, who was uh, the local MP here in this constituency of Fermanagh, South Tyrone, uh, a good man, he had been an IRA in the 50s, he was an Irish speaker, he um, didn't distinguish himself in the mother of all parliaments, he rarely ever went to it, but he did a lot of constituency work. And unfortunately he, he died from a, um, I think it was a heart attack, and it was very sudden. And by his dying, he left open the, uh, the possibility of there being a by-election. And without going into all the details of it, it became the case that we decided that should we or shouldn't we. But eventually, yes, it was decided that Bobby Sands, who was the man who had begun the hunger strike, um, who was the first of uh, the hunger strikers in the, in the second uh, one of them, it was decided that he should be put forward as the candidate um, for, for Manus South Tyrone, the, the prisoner, Irish Republican prisoner candidate. And that suddenly transformed everything. And again, I was in the thick of things. We were living here. We had a little bit of back. We had done a bit of quite a bit of groundwork, and uh, it was only a matter now of just uh, building that. So even though we knew little or nothing about campaigning in an, uh, in an election, we learned fairly fairly quickly, and um, we also had enormous enthusiasm, enormous manpower, and the media, the world media, had descended upon this area. So what we did was we, we opened offices in Dungannon and in Coal Island and maybe one in Fermanagh. Um, uh, the, the, but the South Tyrone end of it was, was well and truly taken care of. And essentially we worked day and night. We went around, we campaigned, we did everything that had to be done. We knocked every door. We uh, put up posters uh, with Bobby Sands. And the quick as we put them up, the RUC who were monitoring us, they had pulled them down shortly afterwards. So it was... Uh, an intriguing um, experience all around, but we kept at it. was completed and lo and behold Bobby Sands had won so the euphoria was absolutely palpable and here in the South Tyrone <coughs> we, we gathered outside the, the, impromptu, the an impromptu gathering outside the uh, the office the makeshift office that we had for the election in Dungannon we were celebrating and we decided to have a cavalcade and travel down to the, the other office in Coal Island about four or five miles away 
which uh, Colin at that time was part of the South Tyrone, uh, the Manor South Tyrone constituency, it's since shifted to another constituency. And um, that was a memorable occasion when we landed, our cavalcade arrived down there. Uh, I remember when I say cavalcade, it was not just cars, but it was also cars with trailers, with pulling trailers behind and guys sitting precariously in the back. It should be borne in mind that it was actually illegal to fly the Irish tri Irish tripod, the Irish flag back then under British law. And we had been presented, a woman presented me with a huge Irish tricolor which had draped the, son, the coffin of her son who had been killed in action in 1973 uh, here in Tyrone. And that was a very, you can imagine, a very moving experience. I mean, she had entrusted this flag to me and we put it on a pole and I struggled to hold it out the, the window of the truck where I was in. We were travelling in and uh, we waved it along with the rest of them and we got out to Coal Island and there were hundreds gathered in the centre of Coal Island, hundreds of people of all age groups but primarily of, of my generation, you know, the people in their late teens, early twenties, huge surge of energy, it was unreal and they'd gathered outside the RUC slash British Army barracks and um, we were clapping and cheering and, and really jeering at the British who in turn were making obscene British soldiers uh, were all hiding inside the barracks making obscene gestures at us from behind the gun turrets, behind their, the sangers that they had and the, the various um, uh, outposts that they had all around this park. These were military forts, de facto, no, no, no other way to describe them. But we were euphoric, absolutely, and the cheering went on. It was just, it, it, we couldn't begin to believe it. And we were waving Irish flags, which was an illegal act at the time, but there was a forest of them there. And Sam's unfortunately on the 5th of May died and um, he was allowed to die in hunger strike. So what the British did was rather than accepting that he had been legally, he had been uh, democratically elected, not going to list it, saying that these were really a bunch of criminal terrorists that uh, no one supported him. Sam's would be lucky if he gets a few dozen votes. Well, he got tens of thousands of votes. But what they did was rather than accept this, the mother of all parliaments turned around and uh, changed the law so no prisoner could be elected from there on. So there you go, and um, that was nothing new, no surprise for us, but nevertheless, it was a, it was a new achievement, new experience. And in the course of it, a number of other uh, hunger strikers have been elected in an election in the South as well, following on from that particular one. But Sands died on May 5th, and um, the place erupted. I remember in Dungannon, I don't want to belabor this, but there was a, a, a gathering that night in Dungannon, which is the local town from in this part of Tyrone, uh, a huge number of people turned out to carry black flags and to mark the occasion, say a rosary. And um, afterwards, the, 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 the RUC, backed up by the British Army, had come in in droves and they were waiting for us. And things got nasty towards nightfall. So <clears throat> people vented their anger. They threw, they, all they had was stones and bottles. They threw those at the, at the RUC, uh, at these jeeps, they were armoured jeeps. And they returned fire with plastic bullets, which were killing people. They had killed people uh, over the over the number of, over the years. Obviously, there were hard PVC projectiles, and they fired these into the crowd. And the crowd refused to disperse. And this this de facto battle went on for hours. It went on so long that the RUC actually ran out. The British forces ran out of plastic bullets. They had used up their entire contingent. And then they started firing, shooting flares into the crowd. So people, were, their clothes were igniting. It was an incredible, bizarre, I mean, talk about human rights violations, forget about that. So um, that type of thing was happening night after night then. And uh, the hunger strikes progressed. Now it's been alleged um, that uh, shortly after that, that I was seriously wounded by a live round in a gun battle uh, along the border and that I was uh, almost died in an operating theatre, but subsequently, well, survived and subsequently escaped um, and found myself then in the United States later on that year. So, certainly towards the end of that year, I did find myself in the United States mm -hmm. of America. And can you tell us a little bit about your time in America? Yes, well, I had been in the US before, uh, in New York, and I, um, briefly in, in, in 1979 and uh, I mean I have to say I, I loved this America I loved the states I, I, it was like a 
home from home. Uh, there, was, there was no great adjustment for me to go there. And I'd had very positive experiences from my earlier visit. Uh, in, in 1978, going back a little, I had been over in, in London visiting a relative. I had been arrested for a week, interrogated for a week uh, in Paddington Green Station and then issued with an exclusion order and deported back to the north of Ireland with a, a, a little sheet of paper saying that I was being deported from England, Scotland, Wales, Jersey, Isle of Wight, Isle of Man, the Shetlands, wherever, um, for, for life. But they were sending me back to part of the so-called United Kingdom, the north of Ireland, which, you know, that's, there's the logic. And they said I could never join the British Civil Service or join the British Army, you know. So I cry myself to sleep every night about that. But, um, so that, that was the hypocrisy. And so they just, there you go, you're thrown out. So I had never any particular love of England. That was my only sort of experience all the United States of being somewhere outside of Ireland. Um, but I was ha happy to be in the United States. It was a home from home. And... Um, Again, the Irish American community was very heavily politicised. They had been influenced again by the uh, hunger strikes. They had been turning out in their hundreds of thousands of demonstrations all across the US, and the support uh, was strong, very strong when I was when I got there in 1981. So uh, I worked, in, you know, I mixed in the Irish American community and so on, and um, uh, the wider community. And it was only a matter of time before uh, I became involved in. Um, helping out the cause again. Mm -hmm. And that's precisely what happened. Mm -hmm. Allegedly, I should say. He keeps coming in. Every level of support is higher now than it has ever been within the history of Irish Northern Aid because American awareness of what British rule in Ireland means is stronger now than it has ever been because of the hunger strike and the attention surrounding the hunger strike. But just how much money is being raised and how it's being spent is the subject of a federal court case in which the Irish Northern Aid Committee is the defendant. The United States government claims Irish Northern Aid is not accounting for all the money spent. Washington also claims the Irish organization is an agent of the outlawed IRA, which is fighting a violent guerrilla war against the British. The judge in the case agreed. Well, what the judge uh, said in his opinion was that the Irish uh, Northern Aid Committee uh, acts uh, as a representative of the provisional uh, wing of the IRA. That is, that they act on their behalf and perform uh, functions for them. That charge is sheer and utter nonsense. It's raised again and again at moments in time such as this when Irish Northern Aid is doing an effective job in rallying Irish Americans and indeed all Americans. But the court case raised more questions than it answered. The judge found Irish Northern Aid was in some cases spending more money than it was getting. But the U.S. government did not prove money was being sent directly to the IRA for terrorist activities. Galvin says sympathies for the IRA are strong among Northern Aid members. I would not equate in any way, shape, or form the Irish Republican Army with terrorism. In the Irish voting movement in Ireland, I knew that uh, what we urgently needed, what the guys on the ground, what the volunteers fighting the British Army needed was material, uh, weaponry, and the best of weaponry. And we didn't always have that. In fact, a lot of, uh, well, a lot of what was there was ramshackle, uh, aged, um, didn't function all that well. So one of the things that uh, motivated me in the United States to, was to help out here and get, get proper material back to the people that needed it uh, in the North of Ireland to, to fight the British and get them out of our country. You know, they had no right to be here. It was a patriotic thing to do. So um, I found myself all of a sudden uh, once more involved in, in gun running and getting and in, 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 in gathering up and assembling weaponry. Um, and that's what a... Uh, I, I was um, uh, involved in, I suppose, in, in throughout 19, uh, 1982. Mm -hmm. um, and in those days, that was before 1986, so everything would have been readily readily available in the United States. Yeah, it was a lot easier than the later, the later stages. So, um, you know, I, I um, worked through contacts and ex expatriates from Tyrone and so on who... Uh, uh, had knew the ropes, knew what to, to do and how, how to be done, mm -hmm. and I I did my duty, and um, 
did the best I could to assemble as many weapons as I could mm -hmm. to send back to fight the British. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I ran a fairly efficient um, network from the southern states, shall we say, of the, mm -hmm. of the, of the United States, uh, into New York. And um, I knew that there were other teams doing other things. And it would have been best that we had worked separately because uh, my particular program was uh, unknown to many of the others. And certainly unknown to the uh, to the authorities, if you like, to the FBI and whatnot. But there you go, things happen. And I was asked on one occasion to uh, fly down to New Orleans, accompany two guys who were travelling down there. Um, I didn't particularly want to do this, but I was more or less asked to do it, and I was I just did my duty. And I flew down there, unbeknownst to me, one of the people was an FBI informant. So uh, all of a sudden I had become now flagged up, if you like. But nevertheless, we went down, we met with uh, what we understood, what I was told were bona fide arms agents and um, from Latin America. And negotiations were already well underway, as I was led to believe. And this was just part of the ongoing process. So that's what it was, as far as I was concerned. We met in a warehouse in, uh, in New Orleans and um, uh, you know, the conversation took place. No actual deal done as such on, on surface air missiles, which were what were urgently needed as far as the Republican campaign was concerned in the North of Ireland. Um, and that was it. Uh, the meeting was held, it ended. But of course, it meant that uh, I was now known to the, uh, to the, to the FBI. Was these were not bona fide arms dealers. This was actually a sting, organi a sting operation and the so-called arms dealers were FBI agents. Mm -hmm. So um, the follow-on, I suppose, what, as a consequence of that, my own particular operation was compromised, and they became aware of it, and probably were quite surprised to discover that a significant haul of weaponry had already been assembled. Um, and without belaboring the, the, the whole story or going into too much detail at this point in time, I was told on one occasion in... I think it may have been May or June of 1982 that my the weapons which I had assembled had been um, uh, discovered, and information was fed to us through a sympathetic um, member of the customs uh, people I think in New Jersey, and uh, they got word to us that the the weaponry had been uh, intercepted, and that it would be better for me to go on the run. So again, I find myself on the run in the United States. And um, this You were held for visuals? Yeah. Irish Republican Army? All right. That's who we represent. What we want is a weapon which will take down, at least take down helicopters, choppers, All right. uh, warships in the sky, right? Yes. Yes, uh, born and bred Pompeii Street started my introduction into republicanism, but it wasn't republicanism then, it was just uh, defend your neighborhood and that was it, you know, so... Can you speak a little bit about what happened there? Uh, well, the, the oranges were, the Cashmere Road and Cooper Street, uh, just a block apart, mm -hmm. and uh, that's the two different neighborhoods. Yes, they started coming down. 
onto the Kaisama Road and burning the houses in one bay street. Just come so over. others in the afternoon. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's when the troubles kicked off. So we just heard the din, the screaming and yelling and so on around. And I only lived a couple of blocks away from Bombay Street. So I went around and just seen that the, the hordes were coming in and you know. The orange orange B specials? Yes. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we're basically throwing stones at them and trying to beat them back. And uh, we did a good job at that time, you know, but it was where the St. Gaul scooter was, that's where we, Jerry McCauley, was. Mm -hmm. I was at the top of the Kaisman Road. So, and I seen this guy coming in with a, a, a gun at his hip. Mm -hmm. and opening fire and I knew actually there had to be somebody hit because there were so many people mm -hmm. in that uh, when we run around the, the street went down uh, the, I could see people all milling about you know mm -hmm. we Jeremy McCauley was lying on the ground bleeding badly and what a grey colour he was, I mean, it was mm -hmm. really grey. And we were carrying him up. We couldn't get an ambulance in at that time, you know. Mm -hmm. So we carried him up and he, he just kept saying, Mommy, 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 and mm -hmm. then he passed away, you know. So we'll put him on the back of a, a lorry, a flat back lorry, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah. And, uh, Got him down to the hospital, but uh, it's just gradually got worse. Mm -hmm. uh, as you say, the, the people were pissed off at the IRA weren't doing anything, mm -hmm. but they didn't have the they didn't have the guns. Mm -hmm. Your brother had one of the few guns in the neighborhood, right? No, we got them okay. eventually. Some uh, I think. I think they were stolen out of somebody's house, you know, somebody had a gun and mm -hmm. we'll find out who had them and, mm -hmm. and so my brother Eamon, he got one and uh, like he was a really good shot, you know, a very good shot and uh, And is it true that you uh, you went and found the fire truck to try to put out the fire? You know, well, the fire truck, the fireman had run away and left the the fire truck in the middle of the uh, middle of uh, Clamart Street, mm -hmm. and so uh, we drove the truck down. There was uh, two guys called Feeney. One guy called Feeney. Mm -hmm. He was a fireman or an ex fireman, whatever. Mm -hmm. So he drove it down. And, and as we we're, I'm in the front of the truck with, with Feeney, uh, the orgies are firing up the street. So St. Gaul's school was in fire. It, it was a continuation of Bombay Street and the Waterville Street mm -hmm. was like, being burnt. Being burnt, and that's where St. Gold's scooter was, right on the corner. Mm -hmm. <coughs> and uh, right next to Clonard Chapel. And uh, we got the hoses out and got it. Down. There's a river down back. We got the hose into the river. Mm -hmm. Now, whether we got that started on that, I'm not sure, I can't mm -hmm. remember, everything is not that clear. Right. But, uh... And you guys were being fired at while you are trying to do this. Oh, yeah, well. yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they were sniping at us, you know, and, uh... But, uh... Father Egan come down. He was up in the rec up in the rectory, up in the, the chapel. He come down and out the back door. 
and the water will sink. So he just had to keep us, you know, get away or, you know, we stay away from the trouble. Get us uh, apart, you know. So, uh, but uh, as I say, he pushed me to, to get me out of the way and I didn't know who it was and I swung around to, to smack him and anyway, <laughs> that didn't happen. But we all got to know each other really well after that, you know. At three o'clock on Friday afternoon, the trouble really started. When a large mob, I think no other word would describe them, a large mob advanced from the Cooper Street area. I do not say for a moment that they, they were residents of Cooper Street. I do say they came from that area armed with stones and sticks and petrol bombs at that time i didn't see any other instrument uh, but they advanced on the catholic areas at this particular time of day three o'clock approximately as you would expect the men of the area were away at work so the defense of the place was left to a handful of teenagers and they did a great job. We were proud of them. They hurled every missile they could lay their hands on into the faces of the advancing assailants. They did a good job. But a day or two days later, uh, I met up with William Hannaway. He was uh, the OC in the Cashmere. And I asked him to cut a join, you know. So he brought me around to a house in Lucknow Street and we were sworn in, you know, the, the Republican movement. Mm -hmm. You remember anybody? We have what you are interested in. Mm -hmm. Providing that the prize is the same one, $10,000 a piece for each red eye missile. Mm -hmm. New York, 
is the hot spot. I would say there's more work done in New York police-wise than any other state in America. So, mm -hmm. him went to get the duvets and him and uh, gave, so... You guys are moving them in duvets? No. Okay. They're, they're, they're underneath, you know, the roll around it, so mm -hmm. anyway. I had to get a gun, a, 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 a truck to go and get the guns or the uh, place in Queens, the bar in Queens. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I hired a truck and mm -hmm. we went and got this, the, the guns, so brought them back on the Evans. Uh, ground the numbers off, uh, off all the weapons. And mm -hmm. That's going on in Flatbush? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So. Obviously, I told you a story with with him tracking Jerry McHugh from wherever upstate mm -hmm. uh, the 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 banks mm -hmm. and taking photographs of him. So took a photograph of uh, him and meeting up with this guy Joe. Who took him round the caves to get the the rifles and stuff? Mm -hmm. So, so it, uh, and you were only in the states a couple of months at this point. I was only there a couple of weeks. Okay. Actually, I was, uh, I arrived I think in February, mm -hmm. and I think it was like April or May when. When you're back at it. And this was going on, you know. Mm -hmm. We got the word from a guy that worked on the, the docks. Mm -hmm. that the, the cops had found the, the guns. And, you know, he told us, you know, mm -hmm. to get the fuck out of, out of Dodge. Mm -hmm. So you, did you get the word before you arrested? Oh well, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. we did. Yeah, mm -hmm. we did. But you decided to stick around. Yeah. You know, they didn't. They just said that they found the, the guns and the ammo and stuff. You didn't know the extent of it. Yeah. We, we didn't know that they knew all that they, they didn't know. Mm -hmm. So. Did they get you and Amy together? How did that happen? Well, what happened was they got me. I was working in uh, Quentin Road and Hughes Anchor Inn. And I finished about four o'clock in the morning. Mm -hmm. I went home in the early hours of the morning, say six o'clock, the next thing. whole group of feds and marshals and everything, and, you know, yeah. all burst in and him and give himself up because, you know, the, the newbie that the came to him and but it was only Ruby was there. Mm -hmm. And uh, he gave himself up. Mm -hmm. So So they tried to bring in uh, your experiences in Long Cash. Yes. In the case, right? Can you tell us about that? Yeah. You know, let say the, the one time when the, the cops beat the Eamon's hands, they would made him put him against the wall and beat his hands with a rifle butts. And, you know, I remember. 
it, it hurt me, you know, it would have hurt me that I couldn't do anything about it, you know, mm -hmm. because you're being held at gunpoint. And, mm -hmm. uh, oh, you were there at that time? Oh, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. So, I'm shouting out to the screws, you know, get a fucking doctor in here, you know, blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. Anyway. So you gave evidence on that at the trial? Yeah. And, uh, and, uh, the lawyer seemed that that upset me, the, the, it could flick a switch and it, it would come back, back to me type of thing, you know. And mm -hmm. So, we, uh, and in the end, I think that uh, they were able to reduce your sentence, right? Yeah. How was that? They reduced mine. No, the, the, the judge, because I was only in the country a mm -hmm. couple of weeks, they knew that I couldn't have been... You weren't long term? Working along with Gabe and whatever. So they cut mine to uh, three or two years. Two years ago. Yeah. Two years, I did, but... And Aim got three, I believe. Yeah, I think so, yeah. Mm -hmm. So, they, yeah. Wouldn't, they wouldn't let us out for St. Patrick's Day. Mm -hmm. So, the cop band come up outside the court, and, and I mean, they played, fucking played hard. And you guys could hear them in the courtroom? Oh yeah, you could, you could hear the fucking sound of them, you know, bang, 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 yeah. you know. I read that, uh, you know, Michael Flannery had declared the, the parade a pro IRA parade. Yeah. And uh, I read that Judge Sifton told you guys to tell your friend out there to stop saying the parade was pro IRA. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. Sifton was all right, you know. I got an interesting quote from your, uh, from your trial here. So when you walked out, you told the reporters that you still believed in American justice because back home in the North, you would have been tortured and you would not have gotten jury trial. I, I can't remember that, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. I could have said it. Mm -hmm. But it, it uh, stands to sense the, uh, the oh, British justice system. Oh, definitely. You know? Mm -hmm. You felt that you got a fair trial in the States? Oh, definitely, yeah, we did. Mm -hmm. You know, like even Gabriel, like he would have got life. Like for threatening the cops, and like he said, if, if I find out you're the cops, you're going down the hole. Mm -hmm. You know, and like what had happened here, Rockland, he would have got life for no mm -hmm. doubt about it, you know. And you'd be sentenced to Diplock courts with no juries as well. Oh, no, no, it wouldn't have been, you know. Mm -hmm. In the sky, in the sky. 